Hello and welcome. My name is Ilva Tar. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Centre and this is Balkans Debrief. We will talk about Bulgaria, which had its uh, parliamentary elections uh, in less than two years, with a narrow lead for reformists, analysts are saying. Uh, the continued deadlock in Parliament has meant uh, Bulgaria has been uh, governed for much than uh, of the past of two years by technocratic caretaker government. To discuss about this and more and what's the future about uh, Bulgaria, my guest today is Dimitar Bechev, a lecturer at Oxford School of Global and uh, Area Studies. And uh, Dimitar, what is your first readout, uh, your takeaway of the election, of the result? Yeah, there are lots of things to be said. Uh, just a small correction um, now as the count uh, goes forward and as the official count rather than exit polls and parallel counts. It seems that uh, Borisov's gap is edging forward and the lead might be as big as 2% ahead of this reformist coalition you, you referred to. But the big picture is that uh, this election more or less repeats the outcome of the previous one, uh, which took place uh, back in October. Um, and there are several options going forward. One would be that the two first, the first two, um, leading parties will coalesce and form a government. Uh, and the other one is that GERP will join forces with two other parties, uh, the socialists, but also the, um, movement for rights and freedoms that represents Bulgarian Turks and other Muslims uh, in, in the country. Um, there are lots of questions around, uh, those two options. And to be honest, the, the chances are not very high. So uh, the default assumption is that um, the caretaker government will continue uh, to carry forward, which means that uh, President Roman Radev will be in charge of the country. Which of the options is uh, more plausible to happen, in your view? I think <coughs> the presidential option is still the one I'll put my money on. Um, because uh, we've seen that before. Uh, parties being unable to forge a common co a, a, a cause. Um, from the perspective of this reformist pro-Western coalition, joining with GERP might be good in terms of foreign policy, because remember, they did vote together to supply arms to Ukraine, uh, and GERP has used its pro-Western orientation to uh, atone for some of the skeletons uh, in the closet um, all those years it has being in government, but reformists might suffer uh, if they uh, can't come to be associated with Borisov. Um, equally, uh, the so-called status quo coalition that in the previous parliament worked together, notably on reforming the electoral rules, uh, could be a way forward. Uh, the MRF is ready to be part of any cabinet, uh, but I'm not sure Borisov wants to go in that direction because it will involve costs for him to be associated with the socialists, uh, who of course are very, at least rhetorically very pro-Russia, but also with the MRF. So there are a lot of moving parts and that's why I think um, we don't know right now, but um, the likeliest option is that uh, the president will be um, remaining in power uh, in that scenario. Uh, Dimitar, what are the factors that have contributed to, to this frequent uh, changes in government, uh, six elections in two years, uh, this instability? What are the main causes? Uh, are they domestic uh, issues? Well, it's a combination as ever. Um, Bulgaria cannot be uh, separated from the environment it operates in. But I think you're right in saying that domestic uh, processes and um, structural givens are probably where you should be looking at. Um, Bulgarian political scene is very fragmented with different parties competing for power. Um, the old 1990s style politics of two major centers of, of power, um, a center-right party and a center-left one, a post-communist one, is long gone in memory and now we have Lots of smaller players uh, fighting for voters' attention. Um, Borisov presided over a period of relative stability in the previous decade, um, where actually um, he could appeal to all kinds of voters and could also benefit from Bulgaria's EU membership, which we don't need to remind our viewers 
also comes with huge financial allocations. Um, we're talking about billions upon billions poured into the country, which provides um, fuel to the system, as it were. But this is now gone as well because uh, GERP has lost support, um, burdened by its own problems. And a, a very strong reformist um, coalition has emerged over time, starting 2013, but really after the 2020 protests. And now it's very difficult in this situation where we have so many different strands, including, by the way, this, and that's a big story that I should have probably started with. And uh, it's one of the surprises uh, in this election that uh, the pro Russian populist Vazrajdane or revival party has done very strongly. So the, the fact that you have um, a populist force emerging, um, a strong reformist coalition, GERP losing support, but not to the extent that it will be rendered irrelevant to a number one party. Um, there are lots of different um, strands in Bulgarian political life. And it's very difficult to forge a coalition um, in, in this situation. What's the public's perception of this political situation, the political uh, deadlock that, that is uh, currently happening in Bulgaria? And uh, do you have a comment on the, I saw even before the elections, but the final uh, result to turnout was 37%. Uh, is this somehow a low? Does it show that public does not have much faith uh, in the political parties in Bulgaria? Well, it's looking at much lower turnout, around 40%. So this is this is low, but it's not exceptionally low because we've seen that before. Repeat elections have led to demobilization. And on the one hand, public is probably fed up with constant elections. But I don't think there is a sense of urgency that we're in crisis, we have to do something and turn up in big numbers, obviously. Um, for all its problems, the status quo is sort of resilient because there is a governance option. The president is providing leadership. You might disagree with his policies, but there is no vacuum in this crisis. Decisions have been made and policies implemented, uh, which probably helps this mobilization because I don't think voters, even if parties are decrying the crisis and calling for um, sort of participation, I don't think it really registers with, with voters. Uh, and, but um, that's not to trivialize what we're experiencing, because if you look at past years, very important milestones have been missed. And number one is Bulgaria's failure to join the Eurozone, because certain legislation was not passed through the previous parliament. So essentially we missed 2024's target dates. We're probably looking at 2025, and this is an essential, essential goal for a variety of economic, but also political reasons. Dimitar, what is the likelihood that Bulgaria moves toward a presidential regime? I don't think that's possible. It's an evergreen in Bulgarian politics. Every so often somebody, uh, especially from the presidential office, suggests that we should change the constitution. But constitutional change is really cumbersome if you look at the way the uh, constitution specifies um, the amendment procedure. So I won't put my money. And the problem in Bulgaria have, is that we have a presidential regime by default, not by design. Um, because of this institution of the caretaker government. In other places, if you have a government crisis, um, the cabinet that has been voted down stays in office. I mean, that's the case, for instance, in Montenegro, which, of course, went to elections yesterday as well. So Dritan Abazovic was voted out in, in August, but he's still in charge. In Bulgaria, what happens uh, is um, if the government falls and parties are unable to form one, then the president steps in and appoints his own or her own cabinet. Normally, this cabinet has a very limited mandate just to organize the next elections. But in conditions of instability, as we've seen in Bulgaria over the past one year, uh, this uh, cabinet becomes uh, involved in long-term decision-making. For instance, last year there was the redrafting of the national energy strategy because of the EU. Uh, but you had the caretaker administration getting busy in something that is really important uh, over a longer period of time. So, yeah, we have a presidential regime. And the problem is that 
the head of state is not really accountable uh, the way it's, the institution is designed. It's not a very strong institution formally, but in such a situation, all powers sort of go into the hands of the president, even without the parliament, to um, sort of ensure accountability. But even if parliament is there, um, the president doesn't have to turn up there to uh, basically give an account of what uh, they have done or what decisions they've taken. And there's a real democratic problem, I think, in Bulgaria in that respect. Dimitar, what are the potential consequences of another not successful attempt to form a more stable coalition government uh, in Bulgaria, particularly in terms of the country's economic and political relationship with the European Union? You mentioned the Eurozone, but other challenges that the Bulgarians will face. Well, there is now the... Uh, was the renewal and the resilience uh, plan. Just to circle back a little bit, this is the money, the pot of money the European Union agreed upon after COVID, in response to COVID, and it's separate from the normal allocations and the structural funds. So it's a big pot of money. The second tranche of this uh, allocation, which is coming up now, is linked to judicial reform, something that has not been solved in Bulgaria for quite some time especially the figure of Prosecutor General. Parties have to uh, do it in the next parliament, and there are many ways of doing it. Um, and if that's not done, EU, fun EU funding will be delayed. And this happens in conditions of slowing growth, because we don't uh, see this dynamism that you had in the year after COVID. So there's a huge price to pay. Now, the previous government has also um, tried to renegotiate some of uh, the commitments under the green transition uh, arrangement with the EU um, to do with coal power stations. And that puts in question some of the money that is there for Bulgaria and the different funding lines. So, yeah, I mean, instability. And we don't need to even get into the Eurozone uh, conversation. So this instability doesn't bode well for economic prospect. It's not that there will be a crisis and everything will go down the drain. But the point is that Bulgaria is um, punching below its weight uh, because of uh, governance dysfunction and because of weak institutions, but certainly it could have done much better. Just one final thing. Eurostat came up with some preliminary data a few days ago, or was it last week? And it showed that um, Romania has done very well over the past decade. So it's now gone from something like 47% of EU average to 77%, or, or, or maybe it was a bit further, uh, uh, um, higher a decade ago, but basically 77% right now, which is at the same level as Hungary. And it's GDP per capita uh, purchasing power. In the meantime, Bulgaria has gone from 47 to 59 uh, so the gap between the country and its immediate neighbors is, is very visible and it trickles down to the everyday level. Um, so in other words, your membership is great, but it's not sufficient for economic dynamism and social development. Well, uh, that's why these elections uh, were a chance to give a dynamism. Uh, I was reading also one of the options is that uh, there may be again uh, general elections with the municipal elections in October. Is that still on the table, you think, after the latest results? Yeah, that's very likely. Uh, even if there is a governance coalition or government coalition, uh, it might have a horizon until the local elections. And it's good that you bring up this scheduled vote, uh, because it's not very visible from the outside. But from the inside, this is the one that counts. Who controls the big cities in Bulgaria is a big political question, first of all, because it's a, it's a springboard to power at the national level, but also because, unlike many places in the Western Balkans, big Bulgarian municipalities are in charge of huge resources by way of EU funds. So if this reformist coalition scores very high in Sofia, uh, or the second biggest city, Plovdiv, which is not unlikely. That's one of the takeaways from the election. They are number one in, in big cities. That will be a real blow uh, to Gerb, uh, to Borisov, because he has controlled Sofia since 2007. Uh, and the stakes are very high uh, with, with the local level. And if you 
interview political leaders uh, right now on your broadcast. And if they are sincere enough, probably that they, they, they'll confess this is what's on the back of their mind, this particular contest. Whether it will be coupled with a general election, we don't know, but certainly um, that's a contest to watch what happens at the local level in the country. That's another important test uh, for for the, for the voters too. Uh, a couple uh, last questions that are related with another issue, uh, neighboring Bulgaria, the N North Macedonia issue. Do you think this election or the new government uh, that will be formed might have any impact in resolving the identity uh, issues with uh, North Macedonia? I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. And we had this discussion on Twitter with some folks. Um, this election is not about North Macedonia, not about Macedonian identity. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minor issue. Although, I mean, now this party that was very vocal now cleared the threshold, just made it in um, Slavic Trifonov. But it, I think it's irrelevant. What it means is more of the same. A president will be deciding... And very much the ball is on Macedonia's side, or North Macedonia, before any of our Greek friends come back at me. Um, they have commitment towards the EU, not towards Bulgaria. And that's, I'm giving you the official Sofia line. Um, they have a, a constitutional amendment to take care of. Um, and actually this will um, sort it out for the time being, because... Skopje will be able to move to the next stage of negotiation. The problem is, when you look at politics in Skopje after the cabinet reshuffle, is that the government is still short of enough votes to get to the constitutional threshold. And you'll probably need cooperation from the opposition, from Vemero Dopomane, as happened with the Prespa agreement. So I don't expect any movement, uh, certainly not in Bulgaria, but potentially also on, on Kovacevsky's side as well. Was yesterday a good day for uh, Bulgarian voters or another day showing they're tired of the current political actors in their country? Well, it's, it's not a good day because people expected the genuinely pro-European, pro-Western forces to score a bit better. Uh, rather, the stalemate continues and in uncertainties, including about presidential rule that lots of uh, analysts and, and politicians are concerned about. The second negative development is the very high score that uh, Revival has achieved. I mean, it's number three now from number four, as we expected. It's the third largest it's party in the Around 14%, yeah. Yeah, so, and they'll be pushing on all their favorite topics. Cancel the sanctions against Russia renegotiate membership in the EU, yeah, uh, try to do that, have a referendum on postponing uh, entry into the Eurozone, and we'll be stirring trouble um, in, in the next parliament. So this is not, uh, it's not a positive development. Uh, the silver lining, of course, is what I said about big cities, that there might be a shift. But overall, it's just another milestone. It won't be the last election, I think. Thank you very much, Dimitar, for talking to us, uh, to Balkans Debrief, and thank you for watching us also. You can be part of our conversation by uh, uh, following uh, us on Twitter at AC Europe. Thank you.